Hello everybody and welcome to another installment of Extraordinary Alien. I am your host, Teresa Livingston. Thank you so much for joining us again or if you're listening or watching for the very first time then thanks so much for being here. I'm really thrilled to have you. Hello mum. <laughs> Today's guest is a very special treat for any listener. She's a, a good clever yarn, that's for sure. But for all of those listeners out there who feel like you are one with you know, a want desire, a mindset towards script writing, toward filmmaking, film production, or you just need a little mentoring guidance guidance in the kick-ass art of trailblazing, then today's episode will be extra sweet for you. Our guest is especially perfect for you. Relatively speaking for one so young, my guest easily crossed the line into the realm of alien of extraordinary ability quite some time ago. Her backstory goes a little something like this. Feel free to take notes and fact check uh, if you need to. Guest. My guest was born and raised in Sydney, Australia, where she was a self-confessed tomboy who just wanted to play football, apparently. Now, footy is Australian for football, not footsie. They're two very different sports, but really <laughs> both sports. <laughs> Her mum struck a deal with her that sent her off the football field and straight into acting classes. And within 12 months, I hear, she landed a series regular role in one of Australia's loved, most loved, nighttime TV dramas of the era called E Street. Now for reference, me being a budding young actress myself, I would have given my entire eraser, aka rubber, and stamp collection set just to be on that show. It was literally that hot. Now, at some point, which we're going to discuss, she was called to leave acting and uh, move behind the camera and start directing. And this is really where some fantastic sparks were lit. I actually think she may have been abducted by aliens and programmed with the neuro blueprints for creative genius. She'll tell us that won't have happened. But I say this because from an outsider's point of view, since making the decision to become a director, it appears to me that the trajectory of her career has been as if attached to a track. And that track goes fast and it goes straight up. It's not ordinary, it's extraordinary. <laughs> She moves to London. She gets a job with the BBC, just the little old BBC. She starts directing documentaries, true crime shows, dramatic reconstructions, starts working with actors, telling stories through the lens. She starts writing a few scripts, good ones, that will come into serious play later in life. And then in 2009, she hears America Calling. I wonder what that sounds like. I got the call, but she was a bit quiet. So she pulls up London stumps and she moves to LA where the embers really begin to smolder for her. Now, I'm not just talking about her career, of course. Her love life catches fire here too. Like I said, it's all running on track. I can't wait until she gets to share the story of her rainbow family with us here today. Stay tuned. It's a very good one. Just like the past decade as her, has been for her career, a good one. As my guest sits here before me, she is a multi-award winning writer-director across three continents. Her first ever feature film, which she wrote and directed and helped produce, starred Christina Ricci, Jack Thompson and Ruby Rose, and won her an award for Outstanding Achievement in Direction, as well as an Australian Directors Guild Award, which I'm sure she's so proud of. She's currently She currently has two multi-million dollar feature films she's set to write and direct for Netflix. Sorry, actually, no, make that four. As we're recording here today, there are two more projects she's just closed deals on with Netflix. And the ink is so fresh on these deals that we can't even tell you the names. Or maybe we can. Let's see. I get one of these. It's a so-so from the, from the <laughs> guest. My guest is so cool, she makes it feel like other cool people might actually spell the word cool with a K. Seriously. <laughs> she likes that. I did too. Seriously, I watched her movie Around the Block her award-winning feature on Amazon Prime yesterday, and it moved me to tears and my husband at least three separate times. Weeping. <laughs> Weeping. Like I had to get the fan out. She made me miss my homeland Australia so much I had to have a little cry about that too. 
Her storytelling seems simple in execution, but it's woven with such strong archetypes, so much humanity and deeply human insight that I couldn't help but resonate with the characters and be moved by their struggles, which reflect my own and yours very different but very same life experiences. It's quite a gift she has, this storytelling. I think that you're going to fall madly in awe of her, just like I did the first time we met. Please welcome today's very extra, special, out of the ordinary talented guest, Australia's own Sarah Spillane. Wow. (laughs) What an introduction. Did you like it? That made me cry. (laughs) Did it really? Well, teary. Bless. I can throw those 12 pages away now. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, actually, maybe I'll keep them and put them them on my bio. I love that. I mean, it's all true, right? It is, yeah, absolutely. There's, uh, you know, it's a condensed time period. There was, of course, you know, little bits of time between uh, London and LA, but but absolutely, there was um, the wow. wow. I'm it's, just you, still a you bit sound wow. fucking good on paper. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I hope I can live up to it. You do. <laughs> You do, because you do have a lot that's coming up. I know you've got something coming up with Margot Robbie. You've got a Juno Temple project. Is there anything that you can or would like to talk about? Um, there's Before a we get into the nitty gritty? Yeah, for sure. I'm, you know, uh, a number of projects that I'm I'm very, very proud of are to do with collaborations with female authors. Yeah. And um, that to me has been um, just something that I've been working hard at over the last couple of years of gaining the trust of their quite uh, well-known authors. Um, I can actually mention uh, Meg Cabot, who has uh, written dozens of, of best-selling books. Yeah. Uh, she wrote The Princess Diaries. Yeah. Um, and I'm uh, adapting the, the book series The Mediator, um, which is a kind of uh, twilight meets the, meets the sixth sense, I'd say. It's, um, it's, you know, it's definitely got a young romantic storyline yeah. with a, a, someone who can communicate with, with dead people. So, I mean. Um, but I'm, yeah, thrilled to be able to um, talk about that and, and to be working with Meg Cabot, who is, yeah. I just, you know, she's such a brilliant author. Oh, my um, gosh. And, yeah, similarly, uh, I'm working with a fantastic author called Anne Frazier yeah. and uh, she works in the crime thriller genre. So in. I've got two projects with her that um, both TV series, one that we've uh, just on my way here close <gasps> to deal with Warner Brothers. So, oh, um, yay. So that's really I'm going to insert a, a, a soccer crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and that's with two fantastic producers, uh, Lawrence Bender, who's obviously, yes. you know, Pulp Fiction and of lots of incredible, incredible films. Uh, Lawrence Bender and, and uh, Kevin Kelly Brown. Um, Good God. So, yeah, that's really exciting. Watch her fly. So, well, yeah. <laughs> Does this feel like the thing that you've been waiting for? Does this feel like the the step that will make other future steps be feel secure and delightful? I, you know, I think, as I'm sure you're aware, it, this is <laughs> such an, a crazy industry, and you you work so hard for so many years. Sorry, I'm just beating the table here. Um, <laughs> you work so hard for so many years, and it it does feel a little bit like everything is now just coming to fruition at the same time. Yeah. And that's, you know, for me, that's both in the feature film and the TV space. Um, and so it's it's a little bit daunting, yeah. Sure. But, um, but certainly these, you know, it's three projects, two, two movies and, and one TV series that are now – Closed enough on the deal side that um, that you know we're moving to into sort of soft prep and, and all for next stuff. year. Uh, the first of the feature films. I mean, there's such big Massive. film projects that yeah, the first of the feature films is uh, slated to shoot uh, first half of next year, which is True Spirit. That is True Spirit. Yeah, that's uh, and Jessica Watson, our Australian girl. Exactly. Good lord. So yeah, that's super. Was she exciting. 17 when she circumnavigated the world all by herself? She was 16. Good god. Yes. Yes. Oh, I just got. I mean, how do you? I can yeah. hardly even go for a swim by myself. She's <laughs> incredible, and it's you know, funnily enough, I find it quite <laughs> similar. I mean, well. I say quite similar, but what we do is not nearly as life threatening. Yeah. But you know what, her commitment to her dream, and then seeing that through. You know, she although she was sixteen when she um, completed the circumnavigation, you know, she started training for that uh, from eleven At or four. twelve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> from the womb. <laughs> what, 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 why did she do it? What was her inspiration? What's her, her purpose, her drive? She, you know, she's such an incredible person that she is someone who will tries to overcome any kind of adversity. And so uh, as, as a younger girl, she had uh, troubles reading. So she had dyslexia. Yeah. And so she worked and worked and worked. Don't we all? And <laughs> until she overcame <laughs> <do>. that. <laughs> And <laughs> it's amazing I got through the intro. So it's all impressed. written phonetically. <laughs> so, so impressed. <laughs> so cool. no. um, <laughs> and so she, you know, she just works very hard at, at accomplishing whatever it is that she wants to accomplish. And uh, her family moved onto a houseboat, uh, I think when she was about 10 or 11. Right. And it was at that point that she then uh, threw the first step which was to overcome the dyslexia and she started reading and she actually read a story about a young boy who sailed around the world by himself and at the time he was the youngest person to have done it and so she read that story and said hey i want to do it too i got goosebumps so then uh she became not only the youngest girl but the youngest person to sail around the world solo at that time australians are brave i find by general comparison we're pretty kick-ass when it comes to or just being crazy. able to, yeah. yeah. Oh, and <laughs> definitely an end. Yeah. But yeah. who doesn't want to be a little bit crazy? It's so much more interesting. Oh, totally. Yeah. Totally. Um, you have found, I believe, in your art ways to overcome challenges, also, right? To break free of those things and really go fucking step, step your set your flag in the ground you know right yeah yeah I, look i think it's it's a process for me it's it's almost it's it's very therapeutic i have to say <laughs> cathartic <laughs> is one of the words i would use and cathartic yeah. yeah absolutely it's um you know when i sit down to write or t- or tell a story i don't certainly on the writing side i don't necessarily know where it's going but it's throughout the process you know i i know the theme um you know i know the the central idea or the controlling idea but I don't, you know, I, I really dig deep into the characters on a psychological level and an emotional level uh-huh. so that, you know, you put yourself into the character's shoes and you create a situation and then you have to become truthful of how you would respond as that character in that situation and that then dictates, you know, the next action or the next sequence. And so it's, you know, I think some people refer to that as writing from the inside out instead of the outside in. You've had acting experience. But I You're on yeah. E Street, so yeah. <laughs> you know how to do it. <laughs> I mean, that really is a, it's a, it's a lovely in to be able to understand this craft from both of those sides. I think it definitely helps. I think both on the writing and directing front. Yeah. Um, you know, I was in my teens. I was young. I was early teens. Um, Doesn't matter. You still E-Street did it. Days. But I did do it, yes. And... Uh, you know, to, to be honest, I was one of those kind of freaky kids that knew at a very young age that I wanted to direct. And so my Why? step into Why? acting, it's because I saw E.T. Oh, And yeah, I, uh, well, two reasons. One, my, my dad is a, um, a professor in philosophy. And so he taught, one of the first things I remember him, you know, teaching me as a kid, I was five or six years old, is um, choose what you love best in the world yeah. and then you'll never have to work a day in your life. Oh, and good so advice. then my mom took me to see E.T. And, uh, and I just, just watched that film and immediately, this is what I love best in the world. Because you knew you wanted to make it? But I knew, yeah, I knew I wanted to make it. Drew Barrymore, you know, that that would be the natural kind of See, connection yeah. of, oh, I want to be Drew Barrymore. Right. Uh-uh. It was, I wanted to be Spielberg, <laughs> you know, because I, okay. I wanted to create Reaching the, the for the medium stars. And the emotion. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, just a little <laughs> I cheeky love little that. director, I Steven love. Spielberg. Look at you um, now. Yeah. <laughs> so, On your way. Um, yeah, so what, seeing that movie as a, as a six-year-old, I was um, I knew at that point that I wanted – be able to cr- tell stories and create magic. Sure. And, um, and how did you start? What was your first step then? What was the next thing you did? The first step was actually E Street. So I... Which was how old? How uh, old were you? I was 13, I think. So so I knew, uh, you know, from 6 to 13 to that moment that that's Some, what I wanted to do. Yeah. But I didn't know how to get there. And shockingly, no one would take me serious when I was oh, an 8-year-old right. saying, I want to be a director. Bastards. You know, can I use your camera or was shockingly no one uh was was really super supportive at that time so 
when when I did cut this deal with my mom that I'd give up playing football uh, and she'd send me to acting class. I did she want this for you? She knew what you wanted and helped guide you? She knew that that's what I was super passionate about. Football's not going to help you get and into the directing. <laughs> I, I think that she was just happy that I was uh, ready to hang up the footy boots, gotcha. to be honest. yeah, Got it. Um, so, and you know, I was getting to that age anyway where um, the boys were suddenly getting bigger than me. I was the only girl, you know, that yeah. played. Certainly on my team, I think there was one other girl in the in the entire Belrose Eagles football club. Go Belrose Eagles! Yeah, feeding team for Manly, Manly Seagulls. Just oh, saying. also it's fancy. Um, yeah. Fancy football. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, captain. Uh-huh. No way. Uh huh. Yeah, you were. <laughs> I was. I mean, it's all falling. In. This is the track I'm talking about. Just a boom, 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 boom. Everybody on board. Buckle up. Here we go. There we go. The Spillane train's on the way. That's it. Look out, boys. <laughs> um, <laughs> Toot toot. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> what happened oh, then? <laughs> so dumb. Hi guys, this is, my name is Teresa. I'm a bit of a dickhead. You'll come to know that about me. That's why I married her. <laughs> <laughs> the desk boy? <laughs> my handsome husband who's operating cameras and all things technical. Bless your heart. Um... Oh, what the heck was I going to say? Uh, so what happened after East Street? Like, what's that gaps that I missed? Like, when do you hang the acting boots up and take on the directing role? Um, I think, you know, East Street, I was 13. Um, I That was a couple of years. I was a regular on the show uh, that spanned a couple of years. You can Google it and watch her. It's very entertaining. And, um, yeah, I, th- I think, thankfully, it's like when East Street became super popular is yeah. when um, – I don't know if you remember, there was like a Mr. Bad character and he had like half a face paint. Yes. I was about yeah. to ask that. The only thing I've never, because I've never seen the show, because we didn't have, we only had two channels. But right. For Americans, that's so good. Like, but we had two channels. E Street wasn't on it. But I heard there was a character who had black and white, white face. Yeah, okay. It was Mr. Bad. Yeah. Weird. It, it was bizarre, especially for that time in Australian television. Yeah. It yeah. was like, I don't know, David Lynch kind of. Winston Smoking the Wacky Backy. But that's when I think um, E Street went, next level in terms of popularity <laughs> and in terms of lots of things. So it, it um, wasn't a mistake. You shouldn't make note of this for your future directing. Just say, huh. Yeah. Black it like chances. Chances yeah. went to vampires. It's what? There was a show called Chances and they turned into vampires. I vaguely yeah. remember that, yeah. The final season, the suddenly vampires started appearing because I think they knew them. I mean, Tarantino turns people into vampires last second too, so apparently it's a thing. It's a thing, yeah. I do rail too often. <laughs> <laughs> it's really a three-person conversation but you'll never see my husband's face on camera unless he's being paid um so i was actually the earlier episode so google away but i'm not sure that how many of my episodes are going to pop up also be careful when you google sarah spillane because <laughs> what came up was a uh, irish championship horse and buggy obstacle race of which i think you won um so <laughs> i was like what the fuck can't she do she's also winning horse and buggy championships in ireland there's a guy in the background that goes if you've left your keys in the car you've got to come pick them up it's very funny that would explain why i had a three thousand dollar purchase on my credit card (laughs) for a horse saddle Is this a real thing? Oh, I got some like random email receipt where they must have sent it to the wrong Sarah Spillane. They just, you know, figured oh out. Oh my gosh, I hope it's the same and woman in Ireland who's I, waiting it, for a her horse saddle. saddle. I mean, hello. Genius, it all comes <laughs> fuck circle. Investigate anyway, sleuth. It's the wrong Spillane. <laughs> By the way, she does not do Irish Championship horse and buggy obstacle courses. Spillane does come from Ireland, though. Good. Good. I'm a Scottish name. Lavingston. Some people who lift the levies to go through the water or something or other. Oh, okay. All right. Not living stone. A stone. It that is starts alive. with laving stone, oh. and then it became living stone. Got it. Yeah, but more important conversations. All right. All right. Well, let's you do were it. you were talking about your um, huh? Interesting. I wish I'd made a note. Remember, you were talking about um, what comes after. <laughs> what comes? What after? comes after E Street? <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> It is Friday afternoon. It really is Friday Approaching afternoon. Approaching beer o'clock, just saying. It's true. I should have got some um, beer. Dang it. Oh, good. Dang it. <laughs> um, what came after E Street? Um, so I 
decide well I decided as a as a mature fourteen year old, um, <laughs> <laughs> along with my parents, that I should go back to school and finish school. Um, because, as I'm sure you two are aware, that uh, kids on sets we have tutors and it's not real school, and you kind of you know slip in a little cheeky maths lesson in between yeah. scenes, and it's that's the color red, kids. And exactly. <laughs> Um, so the plan was to go back to school because I knew that I wanted to go to, uh, film school or university to study film. Yeah. Um, and to do that, one needs their HSC as Correct. it's called in Australia. Um. High school certificate, certificate right? Yes. Um, <laughs> GED, general education diploma. Uh-huh. That's, that's here, isn't it? That's RSVP? I'm just going into things now. LOL. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> um, so I went back to school, uh, completed my HSC, uh, went to university. <laughs> I don't know. I'm like checking fact I know, checking right? Myself. How do you spell HSC? Um, HSC yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I went to university and, uh, and that then allowed me to um, – end up getting the job I got at the BBC and et cetera, et cetera. So Amazing. It was, yeah, it was kind of um, a little bit of a long-term plan, I guess, that it, uh, it wasn't yeah, you just were... falling into things. It was sort of, of course. you know, like I need this to get that. When did you go to uh, London? Uh, that was when I just graduated university. Wow. So, yeah. That's great. They I'm not giving you, you my dates. Because yeah, for you sure. Know exactly. How old it I was 1999. <laughs> was like 2000 fat change. <laughs> <laughs> Doubt it. No wonder she looks like she's bloody 12 in her Polaroid. Heck. Yeah, right. I don't believe you. Uh, I love that. So you've you've now gotten to work in uh, Australia because you would uh, after BBC you went back to Australia and did a bunch of stuff you know yeah. for the Indigenous community you were making a lot of television there. So mm-hmm. You were back and forward, came into America in two thousand nine, mm-hmm. as I mentioned. What then? Because you're in an interesting position where not many people would ever get to understand what's it like to work in the industries across three continents and what the heck is the difference between them and where do you go? I always had a choice between do I go to England or I go to Australia, like, sorry, England or America. Yeah. You know, what's your advice for someone who's like, oh, I wish I knew? Sarah um, Spillane. Wow. That's a tough question. Um, I've, in fact, recently I spent some time in London again and I I personally love British TV. I love yes, it's the best. British crime especially and mm. that's, you know, my kind of work, body of work is split between um, – sort of psychological crime, thriller. Oh, oh my God. And, you have my heart. And, and YA content, young adult content. Yeah. Um, and I personally think that that um, certainly the UK, but um, certain parts of Europe as yeah. well, produce the best uh, crime drama. Um, and so I would love to work in, in British TV. It is it is a little bit more, I find, of a, a closed shop. Right. Um, I, I sort of feel like there are certain companies there that will, you know, produce incredible work, but it's, you know, it's fair enough in a way. They're protecting their own kind of um, industry, you know, film community and industry there. Yeah. Whereas I find here in LA, it really is, it's it's all the cliches about America. It's like, if you have a dream and you work hard, it's you can true. get there. And I I really do believe that about LA. And it's, um you, you put in the work and... Uh, set yourself a goal and yeah and yeah i do believe if it, as cliche as that sounds yeah but I, I do believe you can get there so with young people in mind then which i love that by the way crime and young people it's almost like you're speaking totally my language if i could have you know two greater interests there would be very few what what do you do then like how do you because people don't have mentors like this there's no books or anything that can tell, tell someone exactly how to do what you already knew innately. Like, how do you set a goal and how do you move forward? Like, how do you do these things? How do you understand yourself so innately yeah. and create a path before you? It is, it's such a great question. I I think it's, in my case, I, I do have um, role models that I – look up to and that I um I, I've I've read a lot of biographies of yeah. filmmakers that I admire yep. um and certainly when I was doing you know it's almost like your own kind of education you're you put yourself through your own school in yep. a way and 
you know, when I was reading, looking for books of directors, filmmakers that I respected, there were very few women. I mean, almost none. Yeah. Like, literally, I don't think there was a biography, even though there were filmmakers out there, but certainly not Hadn't a biography. Hadn't even got to that bit. Yeah. So I could access, you know, we mentioned Spielberg before, mm. uh, Martin Scorsese, um, our very own Philip Noyce, who has since become a friend. Yes. And, uh, you know, we were actually uh, talking about doing something together. But but he especially right. was one of my, you know, when I was late teens, early yeah. 20s, doing my kind of self-education, you know, that's I learned so much through reading biographies of other directors. Yeah. Um, and so you kind of... You're a little. I found I was a little bit prepared for what was to come, the good and the bad, because yeah. almost all of these directors have gone through, you know, so many rejections. It's, yeah. it's the same, you know, same as actors, yep, same yep. as writers. Um, rejection after rejection, and you have just got to be persistent, but also find your own voice yep. and and you know, don't just. I, th- I think one of the greatest pieces of advice that I was given is don't just live in the film bubble. Mm. Like get out there and live so that you have stuff to write about or to, to talk about or to, you know, make stories about. Mm. And um, and so that's what, you know, I've kind of tried to apply. And then, and, and it's so true. I mean, now I'm sort of in a position where I'm lucky enough to be, you know, hired or brought on to, whether it be write or direct something, where I have to then go and experience a uh, world that I know nothing about, you know, it might yeah. be um, astronauts or whatever it is. So then, you know, you get to go and and spend a lot of time in yeah. in this world, learning so much about this subculture that you know nothing about. Yeah. Um, but certainly in the beginning, I think it is about finding what what you're interested in, mm. so that you can then uh, develop your voice and tell you know a unique story. Educating yourself is so smart time and time again. That's the same answer that I get from clever people, you know, read biographies. People who are, you know, smart, intelligent and really, you know, on the rise or are sitting on a platform where they can write a biography and be heard and have a voice have the same advice. Great. Educate yourself, you know, read, learn, feed on every kind of, you know, inspiration that's surrounding you. With that in mind, uh, your writing when you come to write – you know, your, your biography in future. But when you come to write your, which I'll totally read, uh, when you come to write your, or start writing your stories, where does that come from? We heard about, you know, your process of how you begin, but the ideas that from their inception, what's that and where do they live and how do you water those seeds? Sure. I mean, to me, I guess there's a common theme in my work and and I think I think most filmmakers have you know, some kind of central or controlling idea that can be found somewhere in, in all of their work. Yeah. Um, and for me, it's it's the idea of freedom and it's, uh, you know, the, the question of... Don't you have a tattoo? I have several. That means freedom, though? <laughs> yes, that uh, means... That's an E for existential freedom. Yeah. Um, in the sense that we have the ability to um, control our destinies. Uh-huh. Um, so that we create our future. Of course. Um, yeah, this one is truth, truth, beauty, knowledge, freedom. Um, oh, good, all good words. Oh, yeah, there's one on my leg. You can't really see. But Come it's, on, get it's, your leg up. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my little heart socks. That one's Arabic for freedom. <laughs> oh, wow, it's beautiful. Oh, thank you. What a lovely symbol. We actually, um, I don't know if you remember, but Christina. Yeah, she had it on her arm. Yeah, well, look at you. Yeah, um, that's the tattoo I was just looking for. I went, Jesus, that's not the one I remember from the movie. Uh, yeah, so we, uh, as as I'm sure you're aware, um, you need to get copyright for any tattoos that appear in films, and so we had to. You know, I knew I knew that I wanted her character to have a tattoo, uh, um, and so I thought, well, I've got copyright for my own. So amazing. So yeah. So we'll talk about above, not above, around right. the block. <clears throat> that really did. I mean, there were some words that I wrote down. The film covers racism, prejudice, education, minorities, ignorance, sexuality, homosexuality, sexual identity, coming of age, freedom, equality, neglect, abuse, socioeconomic structures. I mean, it's all packed in there, right? It's, you can, I can see your heart in every frame. And knowing that you wrote it too, I can really, you know, see what you were, what you were trying to do. And you were started writing that eight years before it became a film yeah yeah that that is my 
absolute baby. It's your baby because you were a yeah. baby when you were I, creating it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's you know it comes from this controlling idea of freedom has lived with me. I think from going back to the football days of you're a girl, you can't play football. Right. You know, we're talking rugby league. Uh, not soccer and so at the time and I you know perhaps still today although I think there's girls you know entire girls rugby league teams now but at that time absolutely not no and so I think it you know I started coming up against these um, barriers at such a young age and it's the freedom of being able to be who you are and um, pursue the path that you want to pursue regardless of gender of race of socio socioeconomic status sure. of you know um any of these kind of what are considered to be barriers mm. and uh so that to me has really kind of um i guess you know contributed to this this fascination that runs across almost everything that i do is this sort of central idea of how to achieve you know freedom and placing that kind of quest in different scenarios you know whether it's a 16 year old girl trying to sail around the world yeah. um you know whether it's in one of the the Anne Frazier crime novel that I just mentioned it's a woman who is a kidnapped victim herself who's then trying to obtain justice for women that fall through the cracks of the legal system yeah um you know I, it moves across so many different genres this sort of central idea of um freedom from racial prejudice um gender sex prejudice um are they hiring you because of this or are you getting in a room and saying by the way this story is going to come from through this filter right is it a it's a bit of both two? actually yeah a bit of both so um i have uh, several projects that that i have um created and that i take out to and um, pitch them? Pitch them, yeah. Right. And there's a couple of producers that, that I work with a lot. Mm. Um, I, I mentioned Kevin Brown, Lauren Spender. Um, Big names in the business. They're, and they're great guys. Um, and so, you know, there are – with them, that's usually I'm generating the material. Mm. But there are other situations and a, a um, movie that I'm just – just wrapping on the script side mm. uh, at the moment, I was brought in by a producer who uh, was familiar with the vo my voice and sure. the kind of you know subject matter that I'm interested in and the kind of tone of my storytelling. Mm. And so she brought me in specifically because the it's a strong female protagonist, sixteen year old rebel, basically. Shocking. I mean, shocking! Wow, <laughs> shocking! How do you ever get a handle on so, it? How would, I, how would I understand <laughs> that? It's amazing. That's a it's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> exactly. Isn't that, again, it's all on track, right? It's all, everything gets put into the cart. I'm, I'm, I'm often made feel better, satiated by that thought too, to know that all the fuck-ups, you know, in the younger years and all the things that you thought you were going down the wrong path, when you get to now and you look at it and you go, wait a second, Absolutely. every single piece, no matter how distant they might feel from each other, is all part of this little mush that I'm propelling into future. <laughs> Absolutely. And how lucky am I that I had parents that Ugh. allowed me to explore that. You mm. know what I mean? I mean, you know, it was – it was tough to convince my mom at times just because she was worried about me getting hurt. Sure. But, you know, I think um, I think when, you know, she saw me on the football field and I'd crush the boys. Yeah. <laughs> she was then like, oh, she's fine. She can look after herself. She's going to go crush the boys in another setting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Kill him with kindness. Exactly. Kill him with the pen. <laughs> yeah. It's mightier than the football shoe. <laughs> yeah, wow, come on. We can edit that one out. There you okay. go. Okay. <laughs> um, is there a story that you're dying to write? Is there the greatest story never told for you? Um, there's a couple, actually. Uh. There's – I'm uh, – I, I really like true stories, um, extraordinary people, which, as you can tell through um, – my next project about Jessica Watson, extraordinary person. Uh -huh. um, she's an extraordinary alien for sure. She's extraordinary. Yeah, you should get her on the show. Yes, I'd sure. love to. Yes. I would love to. I'll hook you up. Yes. Um, she knows people who knows people. Yeah. <laughs> All the people. Um, 
There are a couple of stories, especially um, women that I admire that yeah. have been left out of a large part of history. Great. Um, one, for example, is Simone de Beauvoir. I mean, she is a French philosopher. Um, yeah. Jean-Paul Sartre was her life partner who gets credited for a lot of her work. <gasps> Shocking. Um, because at the time she was one of the first female right. philosophers um, and she really is... Can I ask you a question about him? Sure. Was, was that simply because they wanted to get her work published and they knew the best way would be through his name or because he wanted to take ownership of her work? Uh, to, to be fair to him, he's, of course, yeah. you know, he's credited as being the godfather of existentialism, um, but, but really, and I've read both of their biographies extensively and, and of course, a lot of their work. Um, she, she does have a lot of uh, highly acclaimed published work but she, because she's a woman and because she was one of the first female philosophers, she was really pushed into feminism. Whereas their early days, they went to college together. She, you know, their peers have, um, have sort of reported several times in, in all of these biographies that, you know, she was the more sort of superior intellectually and, and creatively, you know, being intellectual, yeah. I think, is as much about creativity to think of these concepts rather than just regurgitate other concepts. Yeah. Um, and she certainly was, uh, s- according to the peers, was superior intellectually and creatively. And but because she was a woman, she was her. It was very hard for her to pitch material, um, and so therefore, unless it was about feminism, um, people wouldn't publish it. Whereas wow. Sartre could you know he could pitch whatever he wanted because he was a, a young white man and so his work was was yeah. published and reached you know huge huge readership wow um so she's definitely a story the, the challenge with these kind of stories is is finding um i mean there's relevance today but it's it's sort of you know, finding the kind of emotional arcs and journeys and right. relationship. I mean, they've got a fascinating relationship themselves. Right. Um, but that's that's certainly one that I'd I'd love to to tell at some points. Um, there are a few other strong female characters that, you know, I feel like if they were guys, that their incredible accomplishments would have been told already that they haven't been. Those are stories well worth talking, especially in the climate that we're in today. I mean, if anything could compel and propel. Yeah. Our young women, especially Ford, like those are the stories yeah. that are so worth telling and yeah. are so silent. I love that. Absolutely. You yeah. are well well equipped to do that because, of course, you, I mean, going back to your feature film, like you were able to bring the the words of Shakespeare, make them really, very relevant to like kids today. It became cool. It was like you aligned them with, with hip-hop rap, you know. I was like, ha ah. <laughs> Even it landed more heavily for me, yeah. too. I thought that was really, really clever. So, oh, thank you. You know, you know what was funny is that when we were auditioning um, or casting for the the role of Liam, um, that was ultimately played by the fabulous Hunter Page Lashard, um, we auditioned, you know, several teenage Indigenous boys from, um, you know. Sydney, mostly Sydney, some in Melbourne. With Shakespeare on it. With Shakespeare. But I cannot tell you how how easily these kids were able to um, not only interpret but then uh, perform. Like, because they rhymed Shakespeare. That makes me want to cry. Yeah, they would come in <laughs> and it was like hip-hop to them. Stop it. It was incredible. It was, yeah, and I, I was there sort of, you know, I mean, I wasn't there all the time. I was often looked at them on tape. But wow. then if I'd go into the room... And I asked some of them, you know, the guy, I don't know if you remember, there's a guy, he ended up playing Jason, which is the brother's bestie. He's like com- covered in tats. With a hoodie. With a hoodie. He actually ends up shooting in, the guy yep. at the end. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> which guy though? <laughs> um, and so, but he, I don't know, I think he got something, he's, I don't think, even think he had an agent, but the community center or whatever it was, however wow. we found him. Yeah. He got the wrong audition script because he was auditioning for the big brother, Steve, but he got Liam's role ah. as in as an audition. Um, and so he came in all prepared in Shakespeare. To and, do to be or not to be. Yes. And this guy, flawless. Yeah. Oh, and rhymed it. And he's like, and he's not acted tats. before. 
big guy that like you think is a big scary guy, but he's adorable. Oh. Um and Most yeah, hadn't guy. hadn't acted, hadn't been on camera. And uh, and came the... in and gave an absolute flawless, very hip hop rhymey uh, version of, of "To Be or Not to Be." Oh my it was incredible. god, yeah. I love that. Yeah, I have a sense that you would make a really good leader, like a, as a director, as someone who's you're technically the boss. You know what I mean? You're calling the, the the literal shots as well as you know the last words. I feel like you'd be someone who's really good at that. I don't think you get you stay mired or confused for too long. You just kind of move on with a with a clarity and a and a definite choice, right? Mm. I'm, I've been told I'm very quiet on the set. Oh. So I'm, uh, yeah, I'm terrifying. very in my head. <laughs> but I'm also very, very respectful of the performance process of the actor. And so, you know, I think going on from what you said, it's, it is, it's all about preparation, preparation, preparation. So, um, you know, there are so many artists in this team that you're working with. But for me, it's all about having those conversations before we hit the set you know yeah. so it's with the designer with the uh, cinematographer um you know sound engineer i mean every department wardrobe makeup all the rest of it, every department it's all clear that we've Everybody's had the conversation clear. you know i'm in a way i'm probably annoying for uh for certain department heads because okay. i i want you know i really want to have extensive meetings before well before um production start do you storyboard all of your shots before you go in? Um, I do, but it's more for myself. Uh-huh. So it's, uh, you know, I break down a scene, I know exactly what I want so that I'm then free to, you know, yeah. I've had the conversation with the DP in advance. Um, and so by the time we actually get on set, we know what we're doing yeah. and are able to adapt Sorry, it's okay. the it's a bunch um, of the technology. Where, exactly. <laughs> They're the sort of tantrums I have. Um, <laughs> but um, by yourself in your own trailer. God exactly. damn it! <laughs> Punch the microphone. <laughs> exactly. So, um, <laughs> so it's yeah, it's really it's that preparation to to then be confident to be able to throw that away and then be yeah. a little bit more organic on set. Yeah. Um, organized organized i think you'd have to be right i wouldn't know how you'd go into it like oh we'll be fine i there's two things i don't understand is how you go into it like that but also um without a a deep understanding and respect for for the acting craft right i i don't understand how directors can work unless you have that um they're the best ones yeah i mean i know there's there's great technical directors um but I, I feel that if, if you work in that kind of realm, then you should bring in, you know, a performance director because yeah. it's, um, you know, the it's the most important part is being on the same page in terms of, you know, character, tone, story, emotion. Speaking from, like, the actor's point of view, like, my husband is an I was going to ask you a question from an actor's point of view. Oh. <laughs> Do you find that you We're going to take some, uh, some questions from the audience now. Uh, yes, yes sir, you, you in the white shirt. Thank you. Uh, do you, feel, you said getting on the same page as the actor, but do you feel like you're getting all the actors on the same page? Because sometimes I, I feel like having a relationship where just a director and actor on the same page doesn't always work unless the director knows how to trickily or subversively get all the actors on the same page. Mm. Yeah. I, this is where psychology comes into directing, and it's um, just like I'm a huge advocate of pre-production in terms of, you know, crew and heads of departments i'm equally as as uh passionate about rehearsal and for me rehearsal is not necessarily rehearsing the scene but just communication 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 talking through the scene subtext 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 exactly talking through the scene uh with the actors and you very quickly learn that the different actors have different processes and so when one actor might be the type of actor performer that will literally say to me, which has happened several times, literally say, Sarah, you can tell me where to stand, where to turn my head, how to say the line. You can tell me and I'll just, I'll deliver it. Wow. This one particular actor said that to me and she's brilliant. Wow. She's not robotic at all. You know, yeah. one might be concerned that that would give a robotic performance. Not at all. That's wow. what she requires. That's her thing. I then have a, another actor who uh, wants to talk about... Um, his character's grandfather in the Second World War, the, even though it's got nothing to do with totally. the story. But it's backstory and it's, you know, there is so much 
world building that goes into this actor's um, approach to his character. That I, that I, and then and I engage with him on that as well. And and you know he wanted to find a little watch uh, that he wore in his pocket that his grandfather gave him. Never saw it. <laughs> ever 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 saw it. But we chose it together and he we, knows. you know, had a little moment and, you know, and so there's things like that, that I think it's, that's where psychology comes in to be able to cater and respect that process or, you know, on the, a, a third version of that, which I certainly experienced with Around the Block is completely inexperienced actors. Right. And so that's, you know, cause they're, they're young and, um, and just to be able to develop a trust and a, an open line of communication. Mm. And, and for, for me and Hunter, for example, it was about... We just went and watched movies together and hung out and, you know, and so therefore he trusted me. We developed, you know, a little sort of scale system of perf- when performances are too big or too small, yep. and, you know, things like that. And That's so super smart. Yeah. So I think it's, it's different for every actor yeah. and I think it's the director's job is to figure out what that actor needs, how we can get on the same page. Yeah. I think that's incredible because I've certainly been around directors who are that and who aren't that. And I think every actor, inexperienced or, you know, trained professional, well, most, except for maybe a couple that you're talking about, are all like little instruments. You know what I mean? They need to be tuned and we're a little sensitive because you're trying to be vulnerable, you know? So it's it's not just slap some paint on the wall, she'll be right. I mean, it's there's a vulnerability there and I am always – and other actors, I know we've spoken about this, so grateful when you have a director who can appreciate and guide with, you know, with respect and, and, and love. I just think that you will go further than any other director in that regard, no matter what you do, even if you're shooting a bloody, you know, hamburger for Carl's Jr. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's, you still well, need it's, it's, yeah. well, respect. Probably more so in that case because <laughs> you need to oh. create a safe space, you yeah. know, that's like we're all doing this, we've got to, you know – regardless of the material that you know let's figure out how to tell this story whatever it is absolutely and create that safe space you know the i think um what a lot of people forget on a set is that that you know the crew are there together every day for you know ridiculous number of hours every yeah. day and so they develop a kind of connection whereas you know actors just they sometimes come and go, you know, and it's it's yeah. intimidating to walk onto a set. Oh, very much so. And, you know, and so that's where I think it, it really is the director's responsibility to, you know, I'll often, you know, the crew will leave when we're sort of blocking and getting used to the set and, um, you know, getting the, the scene to a point that we're, you know, comfortable, everyone knows what they're, they're doing in terms of cast and, and myself and, you know, usually the cinematographer's there as well. You know, and then everyone comes back in. So then it's kind of, you know, it's right. giving the cast ownership of the space. Exactly right. Do you work with uh, the same team a lot as far as your your DP and your AD and your your core team, the people who, like, are I, the little machine? I try to, but uh, I have to say lately because I've been so split between uh, continents, I've sort of got my go-to Aussie people. Yes. Um, I'm building my go-to people here. I see. Um, and I, I have my British, my recent British stuff has been much more in the writing kind of realm. I see. Um, so yeah, so it's, I'm a little bit kind of bi-Pacific. Is that a word? <laughs> Tri-Pacific. <laughs> Tri-coastal. Tri-coastal, Tri-coastal, yeah. Tri-continental. <laughs> Tri-continental. Okay. Cup of okay. soup. <laughs> Dumb. Mm. Yeah. Again, we're just going to keep throwing them out. Yeah. See what sticks. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to something fun that I wanted to hear all about, which is your rainbow family. We're moving on to a bit more of a, a love lifey situation now. Wow. What is going on with this wonderful life that you've managed to sort out for yourself? It's really fascinating. There's a little video online that she shared with me. I'm like, this looks like it's a really great setup. Oh, thank you. It's it's pretty special, I have to say. It's... um. Yeah, I I have a baby coming. Ah, yay! Here's the uh, soccer fans. <sighs> <laughs> yes, which is you know my greatest production to date. Oh, <laughs> that's right up there with cup of soup. Yay! <laughs> no, it's better. It's better. 
Um, yeah, it's... Uh, You're not giving birth to the baby. I am not. No, I'm not pregnant. Um, <laughs> hence, I will be hitting you up for that beer. Um, <laughs> Sold. Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, I, so I, my uh, best friend who lives here in LA, um, in fact, we, we, uh, we share a property space. Uh, ah. So I have a, a, a nice little property in West Hollywood. And, Great. Um, he's American. He's American, yes. yes. And uh, there's a sort of main house that I live in and, and then there's a, a sort of secondary guest house. Fantastic. And he and It's a little his, commune that you've made. It's a little commune, yeah. I'm so jealous. He and his fiance. Um, live in the back in the guest house yeah. and uh, well which is their house now that's they've converted into a very cool kind of New York style apartment out there amazing um, and we decided uh, quite a few years ago now probably about five years ago that we would like to co-parent a child and so we've been through a I very long journey mm. to uh, get to this place we went through IVF and um, We've got journeys of our own. I know all about some of this journey. Oh yeah, it's the Sucks. IVF is something, huh? It's, it's uh, bullshit. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Did you do the IVF for? What's that? Did you, do the Did you try and do IVF yourself? Too? Oh yeah. So, yeah. so the uh, the child that we're about to have is biologically me. Yes. <laughs> um, and so yeah, I went. We went through IVF Great. and created embryos. Hello. Um, and but for. Reasons I won't go into. I I couldn't carry the child. Well, I could have tried, but I can't. it was the our fertility doctor said, yeah, you know, you you only have a limited number of embryos, yep. and so therefore you want to give these embryos the best possibility yep. to go into full term, into birth, and so therefore um, you'd be much better with you know someone who's given birth before, who's you know, yes. Whereas there are reasons I won't go into that you know I had a certain sort of surgeries and stuff yeah uh, in the stomach region and that um would just you know make it very risky high risk yeah that, um that I would miscarry and so we you know it's not a cheap process IVF yeah. no so it's not we uh it's this, debilitating yeah absolutely so we just decided to go the the safe path and... this is a whole other podcast by the way i would love to i don't think this is spoken about nearly enough yeah uh, not only that like miscarriage is should be expected for every woman absolutely yeah. people think that you're broken and it doesn't happen but it's something r remarkably high that every woman should expect yeah. to miscarry first yep. like we should know about this information i want to get our fertility doctor on yeah. who's extraordinary wow. and just talk Who about this <laughs> maybe dr carrie wombach uh no dr sahikian dr us. sahikian yeah he's uh over in westwood we had a we had a lot of we had drama we had yeah. so much drama but oh, really? i think it's a really interesting podcast and I, it's I'd worth the love conversation to exchange stories yeah. right yeah. i would yeah. love it's, to it's been over five years this right journey. yes four for us but we do not have a baby coming in two years. Hence, I'm going to have two beers. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I didn't know. Yeah. 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 Wow. So if anyone out there, you know, is feeling the same way, expect a podcast coming soon where we'll, like, you know, drill into what the heck's going on there. And maybe some good advice, you know, for it's so getting frozen. Important. If you can afford to yeah. freeze, freeze. Well, yep. one of your other guests uh, was thinking and possibly going to do that as well. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah freezing I is a good idea if you can afford it. as well. Smart. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I, I, cause it's something that I've always known that I wanted to do. Mm. And so in, in case we want to go number two, I mean, let's just see how we go with number one <sighs> first, so but exciting. there's, you know, great. There's a bank out there somewhere. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, super exciting. Yeah. And oh my gosh, life changing. Well, I can't wait to meet him. Oh, thank you. Big congrats for us. Yeah, thank exactly you. right. Well, I'm really excited for all of your you know, new work to be coming out. I really think that, you know, America's going to get a, a good taste of, of you in these you know, Netflix projects and the, you know, the in, independent, you know, production companies that you have coming out. I'm really excited to see where you go and how you use your, your MO, this driving seed that you're trying to share with like young people around the world. I'm really interested to see kind of, you know, inspiration and lessons you can teach the people that you, you touch with your art. Well, thank you. It's yeah. It's kind of uh, like I say. It's it's certainly been a, a long journey. That ha it's not an not an overnight thing. That's for sure. It's been you know a lot of a lot of hard work, a lot of rejections, and you know I finally feel like things are starting to land. So um, 
you know it's it's a it's a tough industry it's it really is but um i think if you you like i say you, you stick at it and for me uh you know building a career in la has really helped mm. um it just just due to the sheer size and volume here yeah um you know i love australia and i desperately miss australia but they're just you know the industry there is for me anyway was not um sustainable for, for me australia will be knocking down your door any second though <laughs> i would love it. i mean the next movie is shooting in australia so that's yeah. you know it's great to be able to go back and forth um and you know like i say i would definitely you know always jump at any opportunity to to work yeah, in australia but absolutely um, but yeah right now there's uh, some cool stuff going on here so we'll see <laughs> well i think you're an extraordinary alien thanks so much for joining us today Thank you. I hear a little ding over there. That's good. Sarah Spillane, everybody. There's some links and stuff down there. Follow along with all of her latest you know, updates. Don't forget to, of course, do watch. <laughs> she has trouble drinking. I have a drinking problem. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to like and subscribe and consider being a Patreon supporter. Don't forget you too are an extraordinary alien. Just don't forget to shine bright. Much love. Bye. Leaving a review and a rating on iTunes has a ridiculously massive effect on the popularity and the exposure of a podcast. So please, if there's any part of this podcast that you appreciated, go take a minute to leave a review and a rating on iTunes. I would be over the moon with gratitude. Uh, you're also more than welcome to follow me on Instagram at at Extraordinaires Podcast. Also, there's a YouTube channel where you can watch all of these uh, lovely conversations it's on the Teresa Livingston channel Teresa is spelled T-E-R-A-S-A -A, just to be difficult and the living stone with an E on the end thank you so much I can't wait to conversate and connect with all of you and please in the meantime and always never forget how extraordinary you truly are